Good evening. Um, welcome to the uh, Soaring Society of Boulder Ground School. Uh, I'm Armin Charbonneau. And tonight uh, we're gonna have uh, our president of the club, uh, Clement Seipik, is gonna give a talk on getting up and away uh, in Boulder, which uh, is not always all that easy. Um, we have some pretty good, we have great soaring conditions here, but a lot of those soaring conditions tend to be uh, on some days uh, pretty far west of the field and you've gotta be able to get back there um, and uh, it uh, can be a little bit unnerving because you got a toe high and then you got to push back and you're getting further from the airport as the ground is getting closer to you uh, as you rise up, as you, you know, uh, soar into the mountains. So um, Clemens has been doing some tremendous flights out of, out of, uh, out of Boulder. Uh, he's been spending a lot of time soaring over Wyoming and, and, and the Rockies and uh, getting down south and getting out west. And so at any rate, uh, with that, uh, I will uh, turn it over to Clemens. Clemens, go ahead, please. All right, thank you, Armand. Um, yeah, so it's, I'm glad there's a lot of interest in this uh, topic. Can you can you see my screen? Yes, it's it. Uh, we got it. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, there's a Basically, the topic is is how to, as Armand said, is uh, uh, how do we get up into the good lift, right? So what you see here on this picture is um, I'm up in convergence along the front range of the continental divide. Uh, you see the curtain clouds on the right. Um, uh, and basically, once you're up here, it's really easy to fly. You basically just stay to the west side of these uh, scraggly looking clouds and you can be almost certain that you will be flying in lift as you just fly along these clouds. And uh, <clears throat> the real challenge is on, on days that look like this is, is how do you get there? And that's basically the topic of this talk. It's not how to fly the convergence itself, which as I said, is really easy, uh, <clears throat> but it is, uh, it is how to get up here uh, and do it safely. So the, the, these are the, the topics is uh, why is launching from Boulder so difficult when we have these convergence conditions and uh, why are those convergence conditions so common uh, where we are, uh, how we can recognize it, um, and then how do we get there? So how do we get there with tow or how can we climb up there all the way from, from pattern altitude? Uh, and it doesn't always work. Uh, so we'll talk about when it works and how it works and um, uh, where, where you should be looking for lift uh, on the east side of the convergence. And the, the lift is, is weak usually east of the convergence on strong convergence days. Uh, often it's, it's low. And uh, so knowing where to look for it and how to go about it um, uh, to make it up there is, is, is critical. And um, if you want to get up there, and uh, it, it's not always possible. So we'll talk about that too. There's, there's times when it just absolutely does not work or it doesn't work to do it safely. So uh, and recognizing that is, is also very important. Um, so clearly there's some safety considerations. And then I also have some, some additional resources that I will uh, point to. Uh, let's see how I get, okay, next page. Uh, so I just want to, before we get into the topic, uh, I just want to share that basically what I'm sharing is a, is a conceptual model of typical, typical airflows along the front range. And, and the way I arrived at that model is it's really based on my own reading of textbooks. Uh, and there's a, a bunch of, of books that um, I listed on the left and I put links uh, in, in at the appendix uh, for how to how to find them. The one I really recommend uh, for anyone is the Soaring Engine uh, by GDL. The volume two talks specifically about convergence and wave and, and convergence is really the, the key topic. Um, there's not one model in that book that is exactly matching our conditions. Um, but, but that book is, is really very easy to understand, has very good graphics. And once you you know, understand uh, the, the, how, how that convergence really works and why it exists, uh, that book really helps you a lot in that respect. Um, uh, anything else is, is really a bonus. Um, there's two German books that um, 
I found uh, quite useful, especially the first one is uh, it's, it's actually called the Entwicklung der uh, Thermik im Gebirge, so development of thermals in the mountains. Uh, it's it's written about the Alps, but it's an outstanding book about mountain soaring, uh, probably the best I've seen. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also one meteorology for soaring pilots. And then there's a, a book by a French author called Dancing with the Wind. It's the most, it's the prettiest book, the most, you know, heavy, it's a heavy, very well illustrated book, but very difficult to read. You almost have to be able to speak French when you read it because it's translated from French to English. And uh, if you don't speak French, it's very hard to understand the English. So at least that's what I found. Um, and then, uh, so these are textbook theory. And then there is all my own empirical uh, observations from flying here and, you know, what I learned from other pilots uh, in discussions. And then there is there's one work that I was quite uh, interested in what, which is called the airflow of a complex terrain in the Colorado Front Range. And that is uh, basically data points uh, measured at different stations along Nywood Ridge. And they, they measure uh, the on how often the airflow and at what times of the day the airflow is, um, is upwards or downwards at different at these three different stations that are all at different altitudes. So the first one is more down by ward, the second one is at the saddle and the uh, uh, and the, the third one is, is even further into the mountains. And um, that, it really helps to understand um, uh, those, those, uh, those data points help to explain the, the model that, that I'm gonna share. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not a meteorologist and I'm not a CFIG. So take everything with a grain of salt. Also, I'm not offended if you uh, think some of these things are really not as I described them to be. Uh, so please do that because this model is kind of a draft model and it, it keeps getting better over time. But I, I fly with it. That's how I imagine the air works. And uh, most often it actually seems to work this way because I, I usually find the lift where I expect, it, um, uh, expect to find it. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is a launch from Boulder. Uh, that illustrates the problem uh, that we face. So I just took off, you see the, the Pawnee uh, right in front and, um, and there, is, there is no lift uh, where I'm flying right now. So this is glassy, smooth air uh, and you can already uh, see the clouds there. And, and the issue is that there is great lift on the west side of these clouds and, and there's often absolutely no lift or a very weak lift on the, on the east side. Um, and, and what is going on is that you have a westerly wind that is coming over the mountains and you have an easterly flow uh, that is towards those mountains and where those two air flows meet that's where the air goes up and this is why those clouds appear where they appear is where those two air flows come together and, and rise because obviously when two winds meet each other and they blow at each other um, the air has to go somewhere and it can't go into the ground so it has to go up. Uh, and that's where those, those clouds, those lines of clouds uh, tend to appear. And we'll get into more reasons why those winds are where they are and how they, how they come about. Um, and then what you also have very often in the morning is an inversion layer that is sitting right here over the, the prairie, uh, where the lift that is east of the convergence is often capped uh, below that inversion. It's kind of trapped. So very early in the morning, there's, there's no lift obviously at all. And then uh, sometimes the, the first bubbles start to rise, but they don't get very far. They don't get very high because they're, they're capped by that inversion layer. Um, and oftentimes that inversion lingers around for a long, long time. So um, typically it does burn off at some point during the day, um, but it can be, and it, that can be at 10 a.m., but it could also be at, at 3 p.m. Um, and as long as that inversion is, is there and depending on how high it is, um, it can be, uh, it caps the, the thermals. And so you might find you launch from Boulder, you might get on tow, you might get into a really nice bubble. Uh, you find there's like this real lift here, but then you get to 7,000 feet or 7,500 feet and suddenly everything is glassy smooth again. Uh, and, that, and you know you're in the convergence and uh, in the inversion and there is, um, there is just no lift. Um, so the question really is, is how do we, how do we get there? Um, so uh, the, on, if you look at SkySight, uh, there's, there's a way to see the convergence forecast. 
so what you see here, if you orient yourself, I've, I've marked the divide uh, and I've marked the peak to peak highway uh, and you see a boulder. And so what you see here is the convergence forecast. Um, this is for I, this is for Tuesday of last week. I you know I didn't have one for the day that I was just showing uh, because that flight was uh, was last year. Um, but this is very typical. So you have this convergence line that is marked in red here, where the air is rising, um, and uh, it tends to be somewhere around the peak to peak highway. Uh, but that it could also be as far west as the divide and it could be as far east as boulder uh, or it couldn't exist at all and um, we'll explain it i'll explain in a little more detail of, of why that is um, if you look at it uh, so this is so this was uh, as i said this was uh, last uh, tuesday this is last saturday uh, and i did fly on on saturday and actually it matched up pretty well with this forecast. Uh, the convergence wasn't as strong, but it was still there. So you can see it in this case, it's not red, uh, but it's kind of this yellowish, greenish color. That's where the air is rising. Um, and uh, it was a little further to the east. So it was a little further east than the peak to peak highway. Um, you can also see it on this chart, which is the surface wind chart. So if you look at surface winds, uh, it's, it's where those two air streams, as I mentioned, where the surface wind kind of comes together, where there's no wind, that's where the convergence is. So you see the westerly flow coming over the mountains, reasonably, you know, stronger. It's, uh, this was not strong, it was very gentle convergence on Saturday. It's very gentle, but you could, you could really fly along when, without much circling, which is nice. Um, and, uh, and it was very calm, uh, calm day. And then on uh, the, uh, and you have uh, this, this wind from the east um, and where those two wind streams come together, in this case, you know, where the blue line is because that's, that's where no wind is. So where the, those two winds come together, the surface wind is, is calm. Uh, that's really where the convergence boundary is on the, on the ground. So let's talk about why those conditions are so common. And, and so this is a satellite view. Uh, you see Boulder, let me put the point down here. Let me find the point to annotate. Um, spotlight pointer, okay. So here's Boulder, uh, there is uh, Fort Collins is up here, Greeley is here, uh, I-70 is here, Red Feather Lake. So this is the Wyoming border. So, and this is a view from obviously from uh, east to west. Uh, and so why are those conditions so common? So let's uh, go to see the, the front range. Uh, I've just highlighted the front range here. And then behind the front range is, is a very dry uh, air mass. It's kind of uh, the arid mountain west, uh, the, the western deserts, typically very dry uh, air mass. And then in the front of this picture uh, is the South Platte River Valley. Uh, so you have a much more moist air mass. So, you know, it's still a very dry air mass compared to European standards. So <laughs> uh, even, even on the east side of the divide, but there's a distinct difference on almost all days that the west side is much drier than the, than the east side. Uh, so we have a, a river valley and, and a, a more moist air mass on the east side. And you have the front range, a big mountain range that is separating those two air masses. So, uh, uh, and then what you also have uh, typically is a uh, prevailing westerly wind uh, that is flowing over the mountains. Um, and, uh, you, and in the morning, you have the, the morning sun um, out of the east. Uh, and the morning sun out of the east hits all these slopes of the, of the mountains. Uh, and so these mountain slopes they have more direct sun exposure in the morning, they heat up faster. There's also the effect that, that because the mountains are higher than the plains, um, they absorb, uh, there's, there's less heat above those mountains to heat. So um, there's, a, there's a, it's called the volume effect, at least in, in the German literature talks about it as the, the volume effect. So you have high mountains and, and less air above the high mountains. So the air above mountains heats, heats much faster than the air in the plain. It's not just the sun angle, it's also the, the altitude that makes a big difference. And, and so what you see, what you then have is you have uh, thermals rising 
above the mountains first. Uh, and also we have the inversion, as I mentioned, over the plains. So you've got air over the mountains rising first, and it's a pretty large volume of air that, that rises up. And, and the air that rises up from the ground has to be replaced somehow. And uh, the way it's replaced is, well, that air that rises up is basically that hits the prevailing westerly wind and it's drifting east. But the air that is rising has to be replaced and it's being replaced by air that is being pulled in at ground level. So this is a surface wind that starts in the morning. So when, when you go to the airfield at 8 a.m. in the morning, typically what you find that is the air is calm on the ground, the wind sock hangs down. Um, and then sometime uh, mid-morning, late morning, um, the wind sock will turn um, uh, will become active and show a wind flow from easterly directions. And that's why we always, uh, almost always take off on, on glider eight in the morning um, against that easterly flow. And that easterly flow is generated by the thermals that are rising over the mountains and that are pulling the air in from ground level um, towards those mountains. Um, and basically this whole thing sets up a circular pattern here. So you have air rising above the mountains, the air is getting pushed to the east. It's slowly, there's a huge mass of land where the air sinks, right? So it sinks up, sinks down over the prairie, over the, over the river valley. Uh, it's very modest sink there, obviously, because there's, uh, there's so much space. Um, uh, but then it gets at the ground level, uh, it gets pulled back in uh, towards the mountain. So you, the circular pattern that sets up. And if you look at it from, a, from this angle, so now you see the, the continental divide over here, you have Boulder on the right. Uh, so this is just basically a, a, a cross section of, the, of, the, of our terrain. You've got the, the hogback, you've got Lee Hill, um, uh, and then you have the peak to peak highway uh, is here. And this is um, pretty much drawn. I mean, this is a, like a typical uh, cross section here of, of our mountain environments. So if you think about what's happening during the night, uh, in the night, uh, there's a lot of uh, radiation that goes up into space. The heat uh, disseminates and it disseminates most quickly actually over the, the cold slopes here over the mountains. Uh, that's where the air cools. You know, if you stay up late, if you go hiking, uh, it gets very cold very quickly after the sun sets in the mountains. And so as, as the air cools, uh, the colder air uh, then sinks down into the valley and, and uh, congregates kind of at the, at the bottom. And this inversion forms where the air the temperature rises with the altitude because it doesn't, doesn't go all the way here. So um, and that inversion layer can be, you know, it can be can be close to the ground, or it can be it can be higher up here. Um, that depends on the day and on the uh, on the on the air mass specifically. Um, but that's basically what what happens during the night. That cold air uh, goes down to the valley, and the inversion forms. And then in when in the morning, uh, this is from our house. Uh, we live up on on Lee Hill, um, and if you look. Uh, sometimes it looks like this, uh, and then I'm really glad I'm living in the mountains when it looks like this. Uh, if you look down towards the east, you see all this uh, dirt that is trapped below the inversion. So this is all the, uh, all the cars that everyone is driving and all the industries that are out here in the Denver metropolitan area. Um, all those exhaust um, particles, they get trapped below that inversion layer. Um, and uh, in the air above the inversion, uh, and so here in this case, Lee Hill is above the inversion. Sometimes we're in the inversion layer too. So, um, but sometimes you know it looks like this, and you can see how how, how much uh, dirt there is, uh, uh, and you, you just basically can visualize where the inversion layer is. And so let's go back to this picture, and this is uh, kind of a view uh, early in the morning. So <laughs> now you've got the sun uh, heating, as I said, the slopes. And if the first thermals will be beginning to rise above that inversion layer. And the first ones are really weak. So we wouldn't want to, this is like, you know, let's say two hours roughly after sunrise, we wouldn't use those for, for flying. We, we couldn't, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't work. But the air starts, um, starts to rise. Uh, the wind sucks below the inversion, as I said, typically uh, you have no wind. Um, even, even up here where we live on Lee Hill, typically in the morning, I can sit out and have breakfast in the morning. It's totally calm. 
um, before uh, the air is, is warm enough uh, to create thermal activity. That happens, but here it happens much sooner than down in Boulder. So uh, at, um, at 9 a.m. in the morning, uh, on a summer day, it's already windy up here. And, and it's not windy in Boulder. Boulder is still calm. Um, <clears throat> so thermal activity starts, so, starts here sooner. And when thermal activity, and then so if you get an hour later, this thermal strengthen, and then you start to see below the inversion, some very little bubbles start to rise. So this is when you're at the airfield and you, you see the hawk starting to circle above the power lines and they don't get very high, right? They, they, can, they get a few hundred feet above ground, uh, but they can't really climb higher because those little bubbles they, they are hitting into that inversion layer and, they, and that inversion layer stops those thermals from rising. So those birds don't get very far and uh, as gliders, we wouldn't get very far either. So we, we are on the ground, of course, we're rigging our gliders and we're looking at the sky and we're looking at, you know, are there any clouds forming? No, there are no clouds forming. And, <laughs> and, uh, but we're getting ready to, um, um, getting ready to fly. So then uh, by mid morning, uh, these thermals over the hills, they continue to strengthen. And uh, now uh, there's so much air rising above these mountains that this air has to be replaced. And so this is starting this easterly flow, this uh, anabatic wind uh, or valley breeze that starts up in Europe. It's super profound in the valleys. So this, this in, the, in Europe, this valley breeze can reach like 20 knots. Uh, on the ground in, in the big mountain valleys um, uh, where that are the main throughput through area towards the, the higher peaks in the Alps. Um, that doesn't happen this strong here because there's so much space, right? The, the, we've got the, the front range of the Rocky Mountains and it's very open towards the east. And because it's so open towards the east, there is, uh, there's so much space for the wind to, to blow towards the mountain. So it's, it's, it's typically, it's not a very strong wind. It's a very calm wind. Um, but it's noticeable and uh, it does generate a nice easterly wind and very nice takeoff um, uh, conditions for us in, in Boulder towards the east. Um, but you can see that these thermals here on the east side below the inversion, they're very low versus the thermals up here on the west side, they already reach pretty high. Um, and then when we launch, uh, this flow here keeps strengthening because these thermals keep strengthening, they pull more, more and more air in. And, and uh, very often where these two flows meet, uh, you will see air is pretty calm on the ground and you've got westerly air flow on this side. And you've got this easterly air flow on this side. And where those two meet on the ground, the air is still, but Basically, the air is to go somewhere, and this is where it goes up. And so this flow is enhancing these thermals and enhancing. And this is where the air starts to rise and the convergence forms. And, uh, and so this convergence boundary is, is not a straight line up. So these thermals don't rise straightly. So you have a thermal it, and it, it it's kind of forms a bubble and it disconnects from the ground. And in the westerly wind, it starts to drift east. Um, and then it, it can form a, a cumulus cloud up here. It doesn't always have to be. That depends on the moisture of the air mass. And you got these scraggly looking curtain clouds that may form or may not form. Again, that depends on the air mass. So the curtain clouds, they, they, are, they tend to be lower. I mean, they're always lower than, the, than, the, than the, the westerly cumulus clouds. And there are scraggly looking clouds up here. And there's no lift under these clouds. The lift is always on the on the west side of these clouds. And the, the reason why there is, there's no lift here and why they even exist is because the, this airflow, um, this is from the east of the airflow, there is more moist, uh, as I mentioned, it's coming from the South Platte River Valley, it's more moist. And, and there's a little bit of this moist air that gets pulled up in these thermals uh, on the east side. And that forms these curtain clouds that are hanging lower than the, than the cumulus uh, clouds that are formed by, by the thermals that are rising on the west side of the mountains. Um, so our challenge always is, how do we get here, right? So, and then we'll get to that in a moment. Um, 
And so there is some variations to this theme. So sometimes this uh, convergence can be all the way to the continental divide. So this is, happens, for example, if the westerly wind is not particularly strong, if you get a fairly, sl a fairly modest wind, um, then the convergence will set up over the mountains. That is very typical in Europe. Uh, so if you go in Europe along the spines of the Alps, there's almost always the convergence sits right on top of, of the mountain ridges. Um, and so this very classic uh, case, uh, and that what you want to do in that case, you just want to stay on those ridges. So, uh, and you always find lift on the ridges. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so that can happen sometimes. Uh, on other days, when you have a stronger westerly wind, the convergence can be much further east. So in, if you look from Boulder, sometimes it appears that it's kind of almost above Boulder, even though the boundary on the ground of the convergence is not above Boulder. It's, it's typically uh, uh, somewhere over the lower hills. Um, and it's just that the clouds form out here. Um, and you might have fo clouds forming further west too, or you might not. Uh, that depends uh, again on the, on the moisture of the air mass. Um, and then you also might get um, uh, in that strong westerly wind, you might get some kind of um, wave flow aloft, uh, oftentimes inaccessible um, as, a, as a wave flow, but, um, uh, but that wave flow can enhance those, uh, can enhance those, um, uh, those um, thermals uh, further because when we're at, at below the, the higher end of the wave bars, um, the, there's, there's, it's much more likely that the, you know, the air is not depressed, the air is actually this kind of a, a lower air pressure system here because of the wave flow. And where the air pressure is lower, that's where the air flows towards and that even enhances those, uh, those upward streams. So you get convergence airflow up here and you get a convergence airflow up here and you've got a divergence airflow down here. So when you, when you fly west under such circumstances, you will find you know, that you will get into, into lift here and then you get into sink and then you get into lift again. And then you have sort of parallel lines of, uh, of lift um, uh, that are tracking more or less parallel to the, uh, to the continental divide. Um, and so this is, you can see the inversion. This is how it looks on, on a skew T. So this is the skew T for last Saturday. So I was flying last Saturday, as I said, there was gentle convergence last Saturday and I pulled the skew T on that day because I knew I was gonna give this presentation today. So I, I pulled this on uh, for three different times of the day for Boulder and for Lee Hill. Uh, and so you can see at 8 a.m., at 11 a.m. and at 1 p.m. And you can see here, at Boulder at 8 a.m., pretty strong ground inversion. Uh, obviously at 8 a.m. you won't get, you know, even though the sun is already out and it's heating the ground, uh, those thermals won't go anywhere, uh, you know, just up, up till here. <laughs> so uh, 50 feet off the ground um, won't, won't really help. Um, on, on Lee Hill, it's even more pronounced at the ground level. So super strong uh, uh, inversion at the ground level. Um, and then you go to 11 a.m. Uh, and in Boulder, it's still, it's not as strong anymore. It's, it's starting to, uh, the, if you, you might get thermals here that rise up till here. Uh, so they would follow those, uh, uh, those lines in this, this direction. So when you have 67 degrees, you might get thermals up till, uh, you know, uh, maybe a, a thousand feet or so uh, up until here. Uh, versus on, on Lee Hill, that inversion almost has almost disappeared. And you can see that at this point, uh, once the air gets to 63, 63 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, that will be here, uh, you, the air would rise up to about 12,000 uh, feet. And then if you look at, at, at Boulder at, at 1 p.m., uh, the inversion will have disappeared. And at Lee Hill, it's also completely gone. So there's no inversion level anymore. So at 1 p.m., inversion has burned off. Um, and uh, in Boulder, when it gets to 70 degrees, thermals will rise to 11,000 feet. Um, and uh, on Lee Hill, uh, if you would draw the line, uh, on, on, if you do this on sky site, uh, the, there will actually be a dotted line will show up um, automatically as you move the point the, along the temperature line. Uh, and that will indicate how high the thermals will go.
So this is a, it's a useful tool if you want to if you want to see how it looks like. I I don't usually use this particular view, but it's a, it's definitely helpful to see what's going on. So this was theory up until now. So let's go to the more fun part. Is is kind of how do you how do you can how can you safely get there? So now we know the, con the in convergence is up here in the uh, where the clouds are, great lift on the west side, no lift on the east side, inversion in the valley, how do we get there? So here I am on tow. Um, and uh, okay, so we'll, we'll get there in a moment. So uh, basically there's, there's two options, right? So one is, and we'll examine both of those options. First option is you can tow until you get there. Um, uh, which is easier. Uh, it's not always easy, but it's it's definitely easier, especially for the glider pilot. Uh, the tow pilot takes a bigger risk with these deep mountain tows because the glide ratio of the of the power plane, if the engine fails, is is a lot worse than for the glider. Um, with with our gliders, where we tow and how we tow, um, we almost always uh, can can glide back out. But we'll we'll get to we'll get to that. How high you want to be. Um, <clears throat> Uh, tolls uh, can be expensive and long, uh, but it's sometimes the only option um, to to get to. So in that case, we'll look into you know where should you tow to, um, and then there's the second option that we we'll look into, uh, which is how do we climb um, our way up uh, from pattern altitude, and that is a much more difficult undertaking. It, it requires a lot more skill um, and it requires a lot of self-discipline and patience. On some days it requires a lot of patience and we'll, we'll go into one day uh, as a case study, uh, we'll illustrate how much patience can be required. Uh, and we'll look into when does this work, how does it work, and where do you have to go to make it work? So let's look at option one first. Um, to, so how do we tow until we get there? Uh, so where should you tow to? And there is no one set rule for any day. It really depends on the day. Uh, as I mentioned, the convergence, convergence can be as far east as Boulder. It can be as far west as the divide. Um, and you should look at the forecast. Uh, the, the forecast that I showed before, uh, Sky said, is quite helpful. Um, although it's not always accurate, so it can be off, the forecast can be off by a few miles. Uh, SkySide tends to underestimate the strength of the convergence. So don't look at the, the, the knots and the, the, the climb rate that SkySide predicts for the convergence line. It's always stronger than that. And you should also assume it's always on the western edge of what is being forecast. It's, it's never on the eastern edge, it's always on the western edge. Uh, of that of that forecast, um, and if the convergence is marked by by clouds, uh, <clears throat> uh, obviously that makes it a lot easier to see. So then you don't rely on your forecast. You actually should look at the sky. The sky is always better than the forecast. Um, so if there's markers, obviously work by the markers and not by the forecast. And uh, you will find that the good lift is always west of the clouds. It's not directly below the clouds. It's always west of the clouds. And we'll get to why it's always west of the clouds and how much further west it needs. It, it might it might be. Um, so here is uh, uh, here's another picture from a tow from last year. Uh, so I'm here just for orientation. I'm uh, at 10,000 feet above Nugget Ridge. Um, and uh, there's uh, uh, the uh, Gold Lake is uh, somewhere ahead here in front. Um, <clears throat> I'm still on tow. Uh, I'm at 10,000 feet, as you can tell. Uh, there's absolutely no lift up until here. So this has been a, a tow with absolutely no lift. Um, and uh, you can see the, the cloud here. And and I already know that there's going to be lift on the west side of this cloud. It is, in my mind, there's absolutely no doubt that I will find lift on the west side of this cloud. Um, and it's it's on the west side because that's where the westerly wind blows from. Remember, the easterly flow comes on the ground. It comes on the ground and it pushes e, it pushes west. So on the ground, and the westerly comes over the mountains. And where those two meet, the air will be uh, calm on the ground. And that's where these that's where the air that is uh, forming this cloud, that's where this thermal generates. And it's somewhere here. 
that's where this thermal generates somewhere here and then that air flows up you know probably in multiple bubbles uh, into into this cloud and so the question is you know so how, how do we how do we get there well I, i'm just basically do i mean I, I can stay on tow until i'm in the lift that's the safest option um, it's also the one that costs me the most money because uh, I pay for more tow and it keeps all my buddies at the ground waiting for longer because this tow plane is tied up uh, on my tow. Um, <clears throat> so typically what I do is, is uh, when I see a situation like this, I tow until I'm high enough that I'm, I'm really confident that if I let go of the tow, I'm high enough that I can put, fly on my own far enough west to connect with this lift and then this lift will take me up to the cloud. Uh, so that's basically how, how I do this. So this is the same picture, uh, the same position uh, from a satellite view. So this is from CU. Uh, you see the Nugget Ridge, the left-hand canyon, there's Gold Hill down here, there's uh, Gold Lake. Uh, there is the cloud that we just saw in the previous picture. And, and this is the wind and here's Ward. And uh, so this is basically where I'm at. And I know I need to get roughly here to then, because of this wind drift, to, to climb up towards that cloud. So I need to get roughly here, so I need to be high, before I release, I need to be high enough that I can glide on my own to roughly here, uh, where I will connect with the lift and then connect uh, to the cloud. Um, so, and that's basically what I did. I released at about 10,500, so I stayed on tow until 10.5, uh, flew past the cloud, and that's where the lift was. Um, and uh, uh, actually, it's about, you know, you can see 10 knots of lift, uh, roughly. I think the average, I would show that too, if you could, um, if the picture was good enough. Uh, so, I mean, 10 knots of lift, even though there was absolutely no lift on tow up until past Gold Lake. So, it was on tow past Gold Lake, no lift at all. And I, I just glided another mile or another mile and a half, and I suddenly was in 10 out of lift. And I totally anticipated that I would be in that, in that lift. Um, and I would say nine cases out of 10, this works. Um, in one case, you're unlucky. You don't find the bubble of rising air that forms this cloud or has formed this cloud. And there's just a lull in between. And uh, you're, you're unlucky and you have to, <laughs> to, to glide back out. But in almost all cases, this works. Um, and so, so this is the trace that you can see. So I flew up here and I started to circle and you can see the wind drift. Uh, the wind is drifting me towards the cloud. And as I climb, I'm basically climbing up towards, towards that cloud. So when is that necessary that you have to tow to the cloud, to, to the convergence? Uh, it's, it's really necessary when, when you can't really climb on the east side. Uh, when the inversion is so strong that the uh, that the lift, so you, you're on tall and you get to 7,000 feet, let's say you get to 7,000 feet and there is, it's, the air is completely still. Um, and you kind of already know that if I release here, I'm just not going to go anywhere uh, because there, I'm not going to find any lift. Even if I get to the hog back, uh, I won't even find lift over the hog back. I'm just too low uh, to safely try and, and climb from here. Uh, in that case, I'll just hang on on tow and wait until I'm high enough uh, to either find lift above the inversion or, you know, I get further west where the inversion has already burned off uh, and I get into lift um, and climb from there or I just have to hang on until I can get, as, a, as you could see in the picture before, um, I, can, uh, I can reach the clouds on my own. Um, and, you know, you, you know that it's a convergence day. So that's also, you know, of course, uh, you see cloud markers of the convergence or you've looked at the forecast and there's this good westerly wind and you notice the easterly wind. So you, you know there's going to be convergence. Um, that's, that's, and then you, you basically know you will find lift in the convergence if you get there. Uh, that's a good time to invest the money and uh, take a high toe uh, to, to get there. Because once you get there, the soaring is usually very good. Um, so how far is far enough um, <clears throat> to tow? Uh, again, there's, there's, no, there's no fixed rule. It depends on how far west is the convergence. Um, and uh, is there sink as you tow west? So this is something, something I always watch whether I'm on tow or if I'm, uh, if I'm gliding out to the west on my own. I very carefully watch 
uh, what the uh, if there is lift or sink distribution as I'm flying towards the west. Because if you have to push through sink uh, as you go west, if you don't find lift, you have to fly back out. And as you fly back out, you have to if there was sink, you have to cross the same sink again. So watch it on tow as you go west. If the tow plane can't climb over an extended period of time, and you basically are just to chugging behind the tow plane, um, and there is there is you know, the tow plane can't climb at all. You know there is sink, because otherwise um, otherwise you would be climbing. Um, so that's it's important to pay real attention to if there is sink as you tow west. Um, on days where there's a lot of wind, uh, there's it's much more likely that there will be uh, sink. Uh, and days that have very modest westerly winds, those are pretty benign, and um, uh, those are those are fairly safe days. Uh, what glider you fly is important. So if you have the twenty one, obviously that requires more margin because the glide ratio is is poorer um, than on the disc guy. And then uh, again, my my glider is, gives me even more uh, opportunity to be a little lower than than I would necessarily have to be in the discus. Um, it also depends on the skills, your experience, obviously the recency, your famili familiarity with the glider, all those things uh, uh, matter how far, you know, uh, uh, how far west you have to, to stay on tow. Um, and then some, you know, some safety guideposts, as I mentioned, on, on benign summer days. So there's not a strong wind and there is no thunderstorms. Uh, you know, uh, thunderstorm days are probably not good convergence days anyway. Most of, well, they could become thunderstorm days, but not in the morning. Um, so on benign summer days, uh, tip, a, good, a good benchmark is for the discus if you're at 11,000 at the peak to peak highway uh, or 12,000 for the ASK 21, um, you should be, and that's, that's just due west, due west of Boulder. So yeah, York, I'm gonna, for example. Uh, Clemens, let me interrupt here for a moment. Uh, the, the ASK 21 probably should not be as far out as the peak to peak highway uh, unless you're much higher than, than 12,000. That ASK can just doesn't have the legs of the discus. Yeah, as I said, it, it on a benign I, on a benign on a benign summer day, right? With with the yeah, 12, uh, 12,000, I think would be pretty scary in the ASK twenty one at, at that. So um, yeah, okay. Uh, now I'll 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 take that. Um, so I will also say experience will teach you over time. So don't don't rush it. Don't don't try. Uh, don't don't uh, assume that uh, this is this is always the case, right? It depends on the day. Um, so then the sec the the second option is, uh, and that's the harder one, right? The second option is how do you climb your way up, uh, and that is more difficult uh, and it requires more skill uh, and more self discipline. And, uh, and so when does it work? How does it work? And, uh, and uh, where does it work? Um, so when does it work? Um, it, it works when you can climb progressively higher as you push further west. Uh, and you can always stay high enough to safely glide out. So those are basically the, the rules. Right, so it the, the you, it doesn't work if you can't. But most of the days you can. The thermals will reach higher as you get further west. Not always, uh, but on most days the thermals will get higher because the terrain gets higher, um, and there's the the westerly air is drier that is coming in, uh, and the the cloud base uh, uh, the thermal heights. Uh, progressively keep uh, increasing as you get further west. Um, but you always have to stay high enough to safely glide out. Um, and so examples when it works is, for example, if you have no low inversion layer over the prairie uh, and you can climb, like let's say you can climb to 14,000 right over the airport. Well, under, under those circumstances, you can, in almost all cases, you can push straight to the convergence. Uh, but that's the easiest case, but it's not a frequent case. Um, the, uh, if the inversion is only over the prairie, and then this is more frequent, so you, there's inversion over the prairie, no lift over the prairie, but as soon as you get to the hill, so you get to Nugget Ridge behind the tow plane, and uh, you already notice good lift, uh, and you release from tow, and at 10,000, let's say you release from tow and you're climbing up to 12,000, 14,000, uh, you already know this is going to work. Uh, and so uh, you, you climb 
to 14,000, and then you look with that altitude, you push further west, you take the next climb, and you climb even higher. Um, and then this is the, the, the hardest case is if uh, these climbs east, and this is not uncommon, so the, but this, is, this gets the hardest and it requires the most skill and the most experience. Um, <clears throat> if you can't climb anywhere east of the convergence to more than like, let's say two to 3,000 feet above ground. So if, if all those thermals above the hills are capped at two to 3,000 feet above the terrain, um, this is, a, this is a, the most challenging situation. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to how that, how that looks. Um, so how do you do this? You basically climb as high as you can uh, where you are. Uh, then you invest the excess altitude. So this, when I say this altitude, invest the altitude, that is the altitude that is more than you need to safely get back out. So you always have to be as high as you need to be to safely get back out of the mountains. But any altitude that is higher than that, you can invest that altitude and push west and look for the next climb. As soon as you find that climb, you climb as high as you can, uh, and you build up some excess altitude above your uh, above where you have to be from a safety standpoint. Then you invest that altitude by pushing further west and look for the next climb. And so you keep repeating this until suddenly you find that you're in the convergence, your climb rate has improved, and uh, you notice that the wind drift is no longer from the east, but the wind drift is now from the west, uh, and then you've made it. And then you, you basically get there. So, uh, but it's very important. You always have to pay attention to your safety minimums and you have to turn back east immediately when you approach them. So this is not something for where you can just experiment without knowing what you're doing. You really have to have in your mind, you have very have to have very clear cutoff points and say, at this, alt, at this point, I will turn around at this altitude. So, um, uh, and, and you have to know this before you fly because you can't make this up while you're flying. So you basically have to make those decisions for yourself, have to know your minimums um, and, uh, and turn around immediately uh, when you approach your minimums. Um, and uh, that's, that's critical from a safety standpoint. And, and you have to be persistent in trying to do this, but you can't force it. There are days when this does not work and uh, you try it and it doesn't work. And so often, sometimes what happens is you try it, I go west, uh, it doesn't work, I'll go back out east uh, and I, I try it again. <laughs> I try it two times or three times, it doesn't work well, then I give up. Um, but, um, but patience and persistence is, is necessary to make it work. Um, so, um, Armand, so this goes to our discussion about what is what is safe and what is not safe. So I think this is, you know, I'll, I'll defer uh, to you on this. Um, but basically, I went back to the same chart with the um, with the uh, you know that we saw before, and and what you see now is I've entered the the uh, glide path for the ASK twenty one and for the discus at half of their best glide ratio. So this is the uh, a 17 to one glide ratio for the, for the, for the ASK21 and the 21 to one glide ratio or for the discus. So this is half of their best glide ratio. Um, uh, and it, that is reasonably safe if it's a benign day, as I said, it's, it is not safe if it's not a benign day. So there's the peak, peak to peak and here is 11,000 and here's 12,000. For, for reference, that's why I came up with these numbers. But I would say, if you're if you're a beginner, I would I would I'm totally with Armand that you should not be even in the discus. You should not be or in, at, at eleven thousand or with the ASK at at, at twelve thousand. It's it's you know you should have your own personal minimums, uh, and those personal minimums have to be you know if you don't know what they should be. Uh, uh, you should be, they should be higher than you think. Uh, they should be higher than these numbers. And I would encourage you to talk to your uh, flight instructor to your, um, uh, and, um, and talk to them about what is, uh, what is safe. And again, it also depends on the day. So what is safe on one day is not safe on another day. Uh, the stronger the wind, uh, the, the higher your margins need to be. Uh, and it's, a, it's another tricky thing. Um, that over time um, uh, you will you will get to appreciate that. Um, 
So how do we how do we get there? As I said, it's patience, right? So basically, what we do is you you climb up as high as you can. You invest. So we have excess altitude, right? So because this is our safe safe pattern altitude. So this is at fifteen hundred AGL. This is how this arrow is arrow is drawn. So let's say you're at, at 1500 AGL, you climb up to 3000 uh, AGL. So you know, at 8300, uh, you get to the hog back, you get to the hog back at about 8000. Um, uh, and you, you climb back up. So you build more excess altitude, you push, <laughs> you push west, you find the next climb, let's say over Lee Hill, you get build up excess altitude above your safety margin, you push west, you push build up excess altitude above your safety margin until suddenly you get beyond the convergence boundary and you get into much stronger lift uh, and uh, that, that takes you, you know, way higher uh, than, uh, than any of these easterly uh, thermals on the, on the right side of the, of the convergence boundary um, can take you. Um, and so this is kind of how it, it seems to be if you if you fly it, the thermals I just drew in this case I drew the thermals as if they were tilted. Uh, they, they typically aren't tilted the air tends to rise straight up and then it disconnects from the ground and then it drifts off. But if you fly it, it seems like this because you see the because of your your wind drift as you as you fly you can watch if you have a uh, and I really recommend this if you have a moving map, a screen that can show you uh, the thermals um, on the moving map. Uh, it only takes a second to glance at the moving map screen to see if your wind drift, if you're drifting east or if you're drifting west. So watch your wind drift. And typically what you see is you see the wind drift from the east. Uh, you get to the next wind drift from the east, wind drift from the east wind drift from the east and then suddenly what you notice it becomes kind of turbulent right here and and uneven and it feels like this is topping out try to push a little further west you might be just at the edge of the convergence and then you push a little bit further west and suddenly boom uh, your climb rate goes up by 10 times or 20 times uh, the rate and, and you're up. So it, it happens not infrequently. You get half a knot climb while you're out east, and then suddenly you have a 10 knot climb as soon as you get to the convergence. So it's it's quite remarkable how this how this happens. And you notice it with the wind drift. So you have wind drift from the east, and then suddenly push, you've got wind drift from the from the west. And it doesn't have to be like straight east and straight west, obviously. Oftentimes these are just converging air streams. Let's say this comes from the southeast, as it often does, southeast very typical. And let's say this comes from the southwest. Um, that is also not untypical. So you've got a southwest and a southeast flow. They still come together. They still form the convergence. And you notice a change in wind drift as you as you get to the get to the convergence boundary. Um, so where does it work? So now we covered uh, how does it work. So let's say where does it work? So where do you go and look for lift? while you are on the east side of the convergence. So now you can see convergence pretty far back in the mountains, um, convergence line. And so where do we go look for, for lift? And there's, there's three key considerations. So you look at the terrain, you look at the sun angle to the terrain, and you look at the, at the wind. Um, so again, let's go back out to a satellite view and look at our terrain. So we've got Boulder uh, and we have uh, Netherland, Ward, Jamestown. And uh, this is our terrain and it all looks, it looks complicated, right? Where do I go? Um, well, so let's first notice the ridge lines. So there's ridge lines that tend to go from uh, along these, uh, you know, between the valleys. So you got the uh, Left Hand Canyon, Jamestown Canyon, uh, Sunshine Canyon, Boulder Canyon. Uh, and you have ridge lines that are separating these. And if you would go out today and walk or tomorrow, if you would walk, you would find that all of this is dry, is dry and warm. And you would find that all of these north facing slopes are full of snow. So even in our own backyard, we're right here on, on Lee Hill. In our own backyard, we have a slope that is east facing, uh, north facing, and we have a slope that is south facing. And our south facing slope 
is completely dry and clear of snow and our north facing slopes are all full of snow. So um, obviously this is too small, <laughs> our backyard is too small to be relevant, but the, these ridge lines, they basically separate the colder slopes and the warmer slopes. So what basically what happens in the morning is the sun will warm those south and um, east facing slopes. And those are the ones that are currently free of snow uh, versus the north facing slopes are, uh, are full of snow. Um, and uh, as soon as these, these, so these slopes get heated up first, and as these slopes get heated up, the air starts to rise along these slopes. Uh, and it, it typically rises, it flows, typically flows along the slopes up towards these ridges and then rises, rises beyond the ridge. So if you would get into a thermal here, you would rise up like this uh, and you drift up until here and then suddenly you're stuck, you can't climb any higher and that's this cue, you have to go further west. So you keep flying further west and, and you have to do it again. Um, and typically the first, you know, it's like you find a lift over the hog back, you fly back here, find a lift, fly back here, find a lift, fly back here, find a lift, and so forth, and so on. Um, yeah, and as, as this air rises, air streams in from the plains, as I mentioned, right? So this is the anabatic flow that uh, where this air that rises up in these thermals gets replaced from by air that is coming from the plains. And the air that is coming from the plains, it's looking for the, uh, for the, and this is another hint here. So it's looking for the, for the, for the path of the least resistance. So it tends to stream in mostly through the canyon openings. So you have these little canyon openings here. And as you go and look for lift along the hog back, uh, you can, uh, it's, it's a good bet that your first climb will be where the air streams in and hits an obstacle where it can't go any further. So this is a good spot here, for example, where uh, you often find a climb where you can find climbs here, or you can find climbs here in Boulder Canyon, right, right off here, where the air streams in, hits an obstacle, it's kind of a thermal trigger. This is already heated up and, and, and the air rises a little bit up here. And so you climb and then you move, and then you move west and you climb further. Uh, and you do this as, as, as until you hit the, air, the, the westerly airflow. So the westerly wind comes over and the westerly air also obviously tries to look for the path of least resistance. So that's one of the reasons why, for example, Gold Hill is a great, is, is, is often a location where the convergence um, line can be, can be right up to Gold Hill. So sometimes you find lift along this ridge uh, up to Gold Hill easterly, very weak lift up easterly. And then you push a little bit beyond the ridge uh, to the west above Gold Hill. Um, and uh, that's where the westerly wind can uh, unfettered uh, flow up until this point oftentimes. And the convergence is right here and you get a really good climb right off Gold Hill uh, at, this, at this spot. Uh, so and that's why the, the wind direction as you, as you climb, watch the wind direction, watch the wind drift. So if this wind drift is southeast and the westerly wind comes, comes in here, Gold Hill is a, is a for example, is a, is a pretty likely spot. Where along Nugget Ridge, same thing, you, so you, you release over Nugget Ridge. Um, this, this bowl here tends to be quite protected uh, from the wind. Uh, you often find, so it, and it warms really nicely, so often find really nice uh, lift right over this bowl. Um, easterly, and then you push further west, and then the westerly wind can can flow, you know, across Gold Lake up till here. And easterly wind, this is easterly protect. This is protected area from the from the west wind, uh, and um, oftentimes you find the convergence boundary right here, and you find find a, a great a great climb right from there. Um, yeah, so here I marked sort of you know typical hot spots. Um, again, it depends a little bit on wind direction, but these, these tend to be really good hot spots where you, where, where thermals are more likely uh, to, to be found. And, and, and the thermals, they tend to appear in the same locations again and again. And that has to do with, um, because the sun heats those spots first, once a thermal is established, uh, it tends to hold that spot because 
uh, once that thermal is established, it pulls in air from underneath. That air comes streaming along the ground that has already been heated as well. So it kind of becomes a little self-stoking in that location. So you get a thermal rising up here and it, it rises up and then you know 20 minutes later, 10 minutes later, the next bubble rises and then 10 minutes later, the next bubble rises and they tend to, they tend to pulsate and uh, from the same locations. Um, which, so these are, these are just some hot spots where it's, uh, where it's fairly typical to find lift. Um, yeah, and then I already mentioned, uh, right, so that's your, your typical path westwards is you find the hot spot, you climb up, you get to the next one, you climb up, you find to the next one, you climb up, you and then you're in the, conver in the, until you hit the convergence and up you go, and then you're, then you're on your merry way. So here's a little case study, um, and then we'll open it up for uh, for questions. So a uh, little case study of a when of a day that was really hard. So don't don't try that if you're a, if you're a beginner. This is May 22 last year. You can look at the traces. There was quite a bunch of us flying on May 22 uh, last year. You can look at the OLC traces and you can see how the path that everybody took to, to get to the convergence, as I said, it's one of the harder days uh, where you could make it from, uh, from, uh, uh, from ground level. So this is, this is the day. Um, where's the convergence? Um, you can see it very clearly marked by the line. Uh, so pretty far west, looks like it's uh, it's uh, at the peak to peak or a little further west than, than the peak to peak highway. Uh, I'm on tow, so you can see the, the Pawnee. I'm at uh, 7,400 feet. And uh, over the last 20 seconds, I had an average of um, seven knot climb. And our Pawnee tends to climb at about five knots, uh, four to five knots uh, at this altitude. Uh, I'm flying with water, so I won't probably get much more uh, climb rate. So uh, what, you know, the question is, what would you do? Um, so I, I was like, I'm, I'm feeling lucky and I released. Uh, <laughs> and as soon as I released, um, I regretted that I released. Um, and, you know, here I released, you can see I made a turn and uh, I really couldn't climb. So then I flew over here to North Boulder. North Boulder tends to be an area that tends to be reasonably good lift in this area. So I tried it uh, and I, I got a little bit of climb. So I did make it to 7,900. So I'm at 7,900, uh, which is high enough that I can safely with my glider safely go over the hawkback. Uh, the hawkback is about six, eight or something like that, um, six, five. Uh, so I can I can safely go over the hawkback uh, with that altitude and uh, and play around over the hawkback and have have a good safe glide back to Boulder and arrive at 1500 um, AGL uh, at Boulder. So I'm flying over the hawkback and I'm trying to um, find lift over the hawkback. Uh, I'm at uh, you can see at 7,600 and uh, looking for lift right here. So I. First, I went over this canyon opening and saw if you know is there something here? I couldn't couldn't find anything, so now I'm keep keep looking along the hogback, and uh, I did manage to find a climb actually right at this location. Um, so I was heading towards that opening again, but uh, and then wanted to continue up here, and then if I didn't find anything, I would have to glide back out to Boulder to the airport. Um, <clears throat> but I did find lift here, and I climbed. It was very weak lift. Uh, so um, I climbed, but I couldn't get very high. So I'm at 8,200. Um, that's how high I could get um, because the inversion capped the, the climb. Um, and so now I'm flying towards Lee Hill. So the Lee Hill mountain peak. So you can see the antennas here on Lee Hill mountain peak. I'm, I'm a few hundred feet, maybe 500 feet uh, off, the, off the ground here, five, 600 feet off the ground. Well, Lee Hill is at at eight three. The Lee Hill is, I think, is seven eight. Uh, is the is the top of Lee Hill? So I'm at four hundred feet above the top, but I'm not flying directly over the top. I'm flying past uh, Lee Hill, um, and I'm looking for lift. So where do I look for lift? Uh, I have in mind that my last wind, uh, my last climb, had a 
southeasterly wind drift. And since my last climb had a southeasterly wind drift, I'm assuming the next climb is most likely also going to have a southeasterly wind drift. So if there's a southeasterly wind drift, it's likely going to be along these slopes because that's a south in southeasterly direction along up along these slopes is the most likely scenario that I will find lift. So that's why I'm headed. I'm headed on the other side of the hill that is in the sun, in the southern sun here, southeastern sun. So this gets the most sun exposure. Uh, <clears throat> so that's where I'm heading. And voila, uh, I find lift right here. So this is Sunshine Canyon. So you can see lift here. It comes right off that ridge. This is the ridge. This is the road that goes up Sunshine Canyon. Um, and this is, this is, uh, we looked for houses in this area uh, last year, uh, two years ago. So um, there is a, and it's, it's nice. It's basically, there was a burn a few years ago. So this area is, heats up very nicely in the morning. And um, so I find lift here. So I'm, I'm drifting, you know, now you see still southeasterly wind drift, not exactly the same direction, but more or less. Southeasterly wind drift up to along this ridge to Bighorn Mountain. Bighorn Mountain is this first bigger mountain uh, west of Lee Hill. So you've got Lee Hill, Bighorn Mountain, and here's Gold Hill. Uh, so right, right, right on Bighorn Mountain. I always, you know, not always, but I often find uh, lift uh, uh, on that on that ridge, especially with the flow from the southeast. And so I get up here. So I, I made it to 10,000. So you can see that the, the altitude that I gain keeps increasing. As I mentioned before, it keeps increasing the further west you go. I, at the hogback, I got to 8,000, uh, and uh, now I'm getting to 10,000 um, above Bighorn Mountain. So I'm higher than I need to be from a safety standpoint. At Bighorn Mountain, as long as I'm at, at mountain peak level with my glider, I can get back out. I would not do this with the ASK-21. Uh, with the discus, uh, it feels low. Um, but with my glider at 10,000 feet here, I'm definitely safe. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to explore along this ridge um, because that is the ridge that is, that is facing. Um, so I'm pushing west along the ridge uh, because that's where, the, that's where the air can flow up from the, from the southeast, since I'm still in southeasterly, uh, southeasterly flow. Um, so I fly up to here, uh, and so I lost some altitude. So I watched my altitude. I didn't count any sink, but I did lose over that stretch. I lost about 400 feet of altitude. So now I'm at 9,600, and I'm getting uh, I'm getting to my safety margins. I don't want to go any further west um, without finding another climb. And so I didn't find it along this ridge. So it would be stupid to go back exactly the same way, uh, the way I came, uh, because I wouldn't, in all likelihood, wouldn't find lift either. So what I'm doing is I look for these spurs that are going out to the left. And these spurs tend to, uh, you know, they divide um, uh, the landscape. And the air, if there's easterly air, the wind protection is on the east side. And this is also where the morning sun heats it. So the morning sun would have heated these slopes on the east side of these spurs. So if I fly out along the spur, um, I'm thinking I might, I might find lift along the spur. So that's what I'm doing. I fly out along the spur. And voila, here in this, from this, wind protected ball here um, where the sun is shining in in the morning, the air rises up. So this, this originates somewhere here and climbs up here and, and the climb goes back up here. So still very weak lift. So I'm getting, you know, probably an average climb rate of uh, uh, one and a half knots or so, or maybe one knot um, in that climb. And I take it as, as high as it will go. So like all of the climbs so far, I take all of those climbs as high as they will go. Uh, and this one got me to, well, yeah, you can see it here. It got me to 11,200. So I gained another 1,200 feet uh, over what I got here. So here I got to over Lee Hill, uh, east of Lee Hill, I got to 8,000. Then I got to nine, nine and a half thousand. Here I got to 10,200. And here I'm getting to 11,200. So each time as I'm going west, I'm gaining a thousand extra feet. So now I'm at 11,200. So I've got X as altitude, X as above my safety margin. 
that I can invest. So with my glider, if I'm at, at, at uh, on a benign day like this, I'm at, uh, at the peak to peak highway, uh, my personal safety margin there is, is you know, around 9.7, 9.6, 9.7 um, uh, over the peak to peak right at the ward, uh, where on a benign day, I, I, I feel confident that I can, I can, uh, I can climb out, I uh, can safely glide out without, without getting anxiety attacks. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so I take that altitude and I go further west. So I get towards the peak to peak highway and you can see I am at, I'm at 10.5 and I'm like, yeah, if I go closer there to Nywood Ridge, sometimes this works, but I feel like I'm too low to connect with any lift along the ridge. Um, and there, if there's westerly wind, it comes straight down here and it probably is not gonna create lift until I'm up, up here and I can't get there. So that's why I'm diverting. I'm diverting towards Ward. And the reason I divert towards Ward is because I know from Left Hand Canyon, the sun shines in here, this into Left Hand Canyon, and it's super warm in here. So I also know this from when I, when I go, I often go cross country skiing or running uh, at Brainerd Lake. And when I drive the car through Left Hand Canyon, uh, this area here in Left Hand Canyon is much, much warmer than anywhere else. So this down here, left hand canyon is really cold, but here it's really warm. So the sun has a lot of room to heat these slopes on left hand canyon. And these slopes heat up really nicely and generate lift just uh, on, the, on the east side of Ward. So I'm making a turn here to the right towards Ward and that's where I find the lift. So it's coming right off this bowl here in left hand canyon where the heat is. Um, and uh, so I'm doing the same thing over again. So I got here at 9, 000, uh, 10,200. So I'm still above my safety margins at 9.7 is really the, the minimum. But you can see what it, it looks like from a picture perspective, right? So in the discus, this is probably already too low for comfort. So I would not want to be here in the discus. I definitely don't want to be at this altitude at this spot in the ASK 21. So um, but uh, uh, basically, so here I'm, I'm taking the next climb and uh, I'm still getting easterly flow and my climb rate isn't particularly high. It's better, uh, it's gotten better. Um, actually the average shows three and a half knots, which is surprising, uh, that's maybe, maybe surprising, um, but it's, it's still not very high. And, um, and then, so do see, see, you see what happened now? So now the color changes. So the color changes just indicates that I'm getting higher, right? On the, because that's uh, the setting for CU is that it shows the altitude. Um, but uh, you can see that most interestingly is that the wind drift changed. So I'm not only getting, and now I'm, the, the, color, the colors change very rapidly. So I was all in red until now, red, 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 red. And now I'm going through like three colors in a very short time span. Um, and I'm getting much, much higher climb rates. So, uh, and I'm basically at the convergence and it already feels differently too. So um, I, this is right, right at this point is where I hit the convergence edge. And, and now I'm, I'm climbing rapidly. I'm already at 14,000 feet. Um, and, uh, and now I can push to this cloud to the west and already this cloud is already on, I mean, I'm already on the west side of the convergence. So I know I've made it at this point. I know I've made it um, and I can get to the next cloud, um, climb a little higher. So now I'm at 15,300. And uh, from now on, the, basically I'm on a cross country flight and uh, this, the, you know, you look at the sky and you know this line, if you follow this line, it's gonna be lift along this line. This is, this is not going to be hard. Um, so just get here, fly on the west side of these clouds, and uh, and uh, it, it will work. And and that's basically what happened. So you can see here the, the climb out, uh, released here from tow, turn didn't work, climbed maybe 200 feet, got off the hog back, climbed a few more hundred feet, pushed out here, climbed in easterly drift over Bighorn Mountain, um, and then you know diverted here along this. Uh, this uh, spur uh, to because I wasn't comfortable with my altitude and this is a safe way out here. Um, climbed back out here, uh, 
got over here, flew over to Ward, got my climb in Ward. Here is where I hit the convergence, uh, and uh, and now I'm on my on my way. So, and you can see I was basically cruising up and down the front range on that day, and uh, pretty fast, always at high altitudes. That's why this is blue, um, and uh, and fast. So uh, easy to fly once you get there. Really hard to get up here. So it took me 45 minutes to make it. If you look at that same day. Um, there was a lot of pilots trying. I think some people, uh, really good pilots, took over two hours uh, to get to the convergence on, the, on that day because it, it was really hard uh, to make. And I got, I got lucky that my, my climbs were where I hoped they would be, and they, they ended up being where, they, where I thought they would be. OK, so we're almost done. Um, uh, common problems uh, as you do this. So. Um, judging whether you can climb out step by step uh, or whether you must uh, tow into, into the convergence. That can be a difficult judgment call. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, I don't know whether I need to tow to the convergence or not, uh, usually until I'm on tow. And even then, I don't know it. So one, one trick is to listen to other people who have launched before you. If you listen in on 123.3 uh, or 123.5 and, and hear people discussing um, what their experience was if they have gone before you, um, uh, that, that really helps because that it will give you a sense of, uh, of where they found lift. Uh, uh, releasing too early can be an issue. So you could see this on this on this last one. I, I was feeling lucky and I released, but as soon as I released, I thought I was gonna land again. And uh, somehow I, I, I was lucky and, and I made it, but um, that might, it might not have worked and I might have returned to Boulder and uh, paid for a second toe that would have uh, been a much higher toe. Um, it could also be that you're too low to connect. So you push west, you get to the clouds, and you 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 fly past the clouds. But you, it could be that you're still too low to connect with the lift because the the origin of the lift on the ground could still be further west than you are. Um, that's bad luck, and then you just can't do anything. But you have to turn around and uh, start all over again. Um, uh, or the convergence, and this is the worst case. Is it's it could be it's so far west that you just cannot get to it. Uh, and there are days when it's definitely impossible uh, to get to. Uh, and, uh, and there's just nothing to do about it but to return to the airport and fly another day. Um, some other tips here is, is, is a be prepared. So look at the forecast, uh, know if there's a convergence day, um, look at the wind at different altitudes. I think that's, that's really important. Uh, how strong is the wind? Um, that's also important. Um, as I mentioned, listen to other pilots, what they did. Um, you've got to be patient. Uh, the climbs on the east side, they can be very weak. You may have to deal with half a knot climb, and you just have to milk that climb as high as, high as it will go, uh, because you need that excess altitude over your safety margin uh, to uh, give you room to, uh, to invest that altitude and push west. Um, and it can take multiple of those weak climbs until uh, you get there. Um, and uh, it really, really important, be safe, please uh, be safe. Uh, as soon as you have to always know what your minimums are. And as soon as you get, uh, uh, have a risk that, uh, that you might get too low, um, uh, turn east immediately. Or if you hit sink and you know you have to fly through that same sink again, and you don't have the altitude to do it, uh, don't hesitate. Just just go back out and, uh, and, and uh, try it again or fly another day. That's uh, it's really important. Um, and don't get discouraged. So there's always another opportunity and not every day will work. Um, yeah, safety considerations. I think we hit on most of those. So be sure you know what your safety margins are and they have to be appropriate for the day as well as for your skills, experience and your recency. Uh, some days really require much higher safety margins, especially if the wind is strong or if there's a possibility of storm outflows. Um, uh, pay close attention to sink as you push west. Uh, you will have to fly through the same sink again if you have to return. Um, when you fly close to the ground, very important, maintain extra airspeed. Convergence tends to be 
uh, reasonably turbulent um, because you have multiple winds coming together. So there is a possibility that suddenly you reach an altitude and um, the, the wind is now from the west and it will hit you from behind. So if you're not fast enough, there's a risk uh, of stalling. So you want to be high enough and you want to be fast enough that you can recover from a stall and a potential spin in. So uh, really important. Um, always consider the worst case scenario and uh, what's your plan A, plan B, plan C and don't take chances. So just because something has worked uh, 99 times, um, it doesn't mean it will work another time. So, so don't, don't be lulled by, um, I've done this 100 times, I, you know, I can do it 101 times. Uh, if, if it wasn't safe the first 100 times, it's not safe the 101st time. Uh, that's, uh, I keep telling myself that basically on every flight. Um, yeah, some closing thoughts. So convergence conditions, pretty typical in Boulder. Um, on most thermal days, there's some convergence. It's almost always stronger than SkySight predicts. So, uh, and even if SkySight doesn't predict convergence, doesn't mean it's not there. It's almost always there. Um, it's, a, it's a boon and a bane uh, because it's a, uh, if, if, if the day is, if it's strong you can, and you can get there, um, you, have a, you can have a really long flight at high speeds and you don't have to turn much. You can just go straight. Um, but on some days you just can't get there. So be prepared, be patient and be safe and have fun. That's I think what I wanted to cover. So here's, the, here's some resources, as I mentioned, uh, I will provide a link when, when Armand publishes this, uh, I will provide a link to this document as well. And these links, these uh, links should, these hyperlinks should be active uh, in the document that we send out. Uh, so you can, you can look these things up um, and uh, in these books, you just look them up. I mean, this one, I really recommend this uh, soaring engine um, uh, by GTL. I would suggest all three volumes of, all three volumes are excellent. And volume two is, is probably the best work on convergence that than, than uh, what I've seen so far. Um, and then there is some, you know, some pop things that I've published about the convergence because it's so important for Boulder. I wrote a number of times important about it as I, as I learned. There was this one interesting flight where Bob Ferris told me he had the best, you know, best day of the best day of the season, and I couldn't get to the line at all. And I tried to understand why I didn't get there, and uh, it was quite illuminating. Um, and uh, then uh, I've got some, some videos as well. So th this first one in particular is interesting for that explains a similar situation as the one that is in the case study that we just covered. Uh, you just see it in a, in a video form uh, and it's not the same flight, it's a different flight, but it's very similar situation. And the, these two are more flying along the convergence. They're not so much as getting into the, into the convergence. So that's I think that's it. Yep, that's it. So let me turn off the screen share and uh, we can do questions or you can tell me what I, what I did wrong and, uh, and I will adjust my model. Well, Clemens, this was one of the, one of the best we've had of the series. Thanks so much. Um, uh, we, we, great presentation, great uh, graphics. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, I think a lot of others did too. I'm seeing some thumbs up there on the, uh, so, uh, but at any rate, um, please let's let's open it up to some other folks and and uh, let me know what uh, uh, what other people think. Anybody? I have a question. Sure. Um, sure. So with the um, convergence, is it? It seems like it's probably more likely in the summertime. Um, does it tend to move east and west based on the time of year? And for that matter, would that make it easier to get into the convergence, say, in spring versus the summer? And I guess to uh, follow on to that. A, this, is a, this is a good question. Um, I am not sure I know the full answer. So here's my, what I think, what I think. I think it's not more likely in the summer than now. It, it, does, it does require two things. It requires thermals over the hills and it requires a west wind. 
and those conditions are already present. I think what changes in the summer is that the mountains are free of snow. And once the mountains, the high mountains are free of snow, you get more heating further west. And as you get more heating further west, that tends to move the convergence further west because those thermals will rise further west. Uh, but I've also seen it in the summer that it's not further west. And then it also can move during the day. So as the wind, as the wind speed changes during the day, the line can move. And as the and then, then during the day, it's, it tends to move because the sun moves around. Uh, so this this um, it actually tends to be oftentimes it tends to be stronger in the in the morning actually when we get up than than it is during the day. But all these things are fluctuating, and I don't have a good so if somebody knows more about this or has more hypotheses, I'd, I'd love to hear it. I, I'm not sure. Hey, Clemens, my question is going to be, well, to, to start off, there are no dumb questions in these sessions. So as you're cruising uh, in the convergence, how much are you actually turning and how much are you just going straight? Uh, unlike surfing, uh, you know, uh, wave soaring. So are, are you going to be find stronger bits where you're actually going to be turning, or are you going to pre be pretty much going straight all the way? I, when I, when I, when I can, I tend to go straight. Uh, but there's, it's a I have a different. My flying style is pretty conservative, and I tend to be high and not fly too fast. Uh, and there's others who fly much faster and uh, in cruise, and then they have to stop more to climb. And on balance, I'm not entirely sure which, which strategy works better. Uh, mine is definitely safer to be higher. <laughs> um, yeah. But the, uh, if, if the conditions allow, I will, I will just fly straight and adjust my speed and go straight. And there, there, is a, there was a flight last year where I flew more than 300 kilometers without one turn. Thank you. I have a question. First of all, that was fantastic, Clemens. Um, great, great presentation. I um, was wondering when you use SkySight convergence lines, and you said earlier that it's usually deeper west than SkySkite would um, depict it. Do you think you would go? clear into where the color band starts on the west side to find convergence, or is it not that um, precise? That's my bias, but it's not always accurate. It can be, it, and sometimes it's really off. And sometimes SkySet predicts no convergence at all, and it's still there quite strongly. Actually, last Saturday, SkySet did not predict conversion. Uh, actually, it did predict. Uh, it did predict some, but not much. Yeah. So, so sometimes it doesn't predict any, and it's still there. You can't really rely on it, but it's it's the best convergence forecast there is. I talked to somebody from the the people who do these uh, the soaring forecast, uh, you know, the the, the the National Weather Service for soaring forecast, and I asked them specifically if they could provide a convergence forecast. And they said it's impossible. So uh, obviously SkySight is able to do one and it's reasonably accurate, but it's not always accurate. It's really hard to do. Hey, Clemens, uh, Jason from Granby. First off, uh, thanks so much uh, for an outstanding presentation. Um, so my question is, uh, do you have any strategies for tying in the, to the convergence from the west side of the divide? in terms of specific locations. And uh, follow-up question, have you been able to model the wave soaring in Condor to remotely resemble how the convergence works? Okay, the second one first, no. And it, Condor does not work at our altitudes at all for wave. Uh, because Condor assumes that uh, wave is always at, at 5,000 meters and our mountains are too high. So you can forget wave soaring in Condor in our area. Uh, the second one is tying into the convergence is obviously in the same space 
as, uh, as it is from here. Uh, if you come from the West, what I found is that the best locations to cross the divide, they tend to be where the mountains, along where the mountains run most often. So obviously it depends on the day. So look at the forecast. Uh, but uh, the, the one of the best crossover points um, it tends to be the ridge north of Estes Park. So if you come over from Steamboat on the south side of North Park, um, over this, um, I forgot what the mountain ridge is called, the Rabbit Ears Range. Mm -hmm. If you come along this Rabbit Ears, Ears Range, and uh, across the divide sort of north of Estes Park, this, this ridge runs all the way to Fort Collins. Um, if you go to that ridge and from there, if you get to Lookout Mountain, which is, is about um, halfway between the divide and Fort Collins, uh, the Lookout Mountain tends to be pretty much on the convergence line, on that energy line. And then from there, you can go south uh, or north. Um, south is more reliable than north. And especially the Estes Park area is not super reliable, uh, but then once you get past Long's Peak, it becomes pretty reliable. Okay, and then uh, also you said that uh, uh, the lighter westerly wind days, the, the convergence tends to set up further west, so that would be advantageous? I don't Not, know if I don't know if it would maybe from your side maybe from your perspective it might be advantageous yeah especially because you have to go back to <laughs> to the west <laughs> so yeah you're right I mean there there are days when the convergence is actually on the other side I mean it's kind yeah. of right on top of the divide or it could even be slightly west of the divide then you might even I don't know I mean uh, well you wouldn't have ridge lift probably on those days because the the wind would be too weak. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't have. I don't. I. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Bob Ferris knows, or somebody else who's uh, who's flown this a lot. Thanks, Clemens. Um, if nobody else has uh, a question right now. I'm going to say a little bit about the, the, the safety and the making it back. Um, the K21, uh, you know, when we talk about glide uh, ratio, uh, that's, you know, that works pretty well if you're close to the airport, but as you get further and further away, uh, that, that becomes less reliable uh, because there's so much sink. Um, if you're doing the thing where you have to tow really high, through it, through the eastern, you know, through the eastern side of the convergence where there's an east wind. Now you got to go back to the airport upwind. Uh, there could be sink along the way. Uh, the K21 doesn't penetrate well. And, and typically our, our newer pilots are flying the K21. So that's kind of why I chimed in and said, you know, yeah, don't, no, try that's fair. don't try this with a K21. <laughs> wait, yeah. wait till you're flying the DG or the. Yeah, the, that's a good, that's a good, that's good advice. Yeah. I mean, if you, yeah. if you, if you, if you don't, if you don't fly the disc guy because you're not checked out in it and you have not enough experience to be able to fly them, don't do it in the K21. Yeah, don't I do it totally, the K agree with, uh, totally agree yeah. with that. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you're out in the K21 and you've climbed up at the hogback and you get to 10,000 feet at the hogback, and you push back to Lee Hill and you get to 11,000 feet and you get you know, 12,000 feet a little further back. Okay, because then you know you, you've, got a, you've got thermals to make it back. Uh, but remember, we don't have a trailer for the K21. So if you only- make Well, the trailer, won't, the trailer won't help because you can't land there anywhere. No, but I mean, if you only made it, if you at least made it out of the mountains uh, and, and into you know, a pasture somewhere, uh, it's going to be a problem. So we, we just really don't want the K-21 on a cross country. And that pushing back, you know, that uh, th th this great presentation, uh, but you, it really requires for safety purposes, a high, a high performance uh, glider that, that you can push back through if you have a headwind, that you can go fast if you get sink. Um, so, you know, even when we had the, uh, the 134, uh, I sure wouldn't recommend doing, you know, if you had a, 
you know, a no lift, you know, you're in the, uh, you know, and, and you're going through and, and you have to get towed all the way to, to Ward and, and now you're at 11,000 feet at Ward and there's no lift on the way back. That's going to be pretty tense if you don't if you don't connect. Um, so let's let's keep safety in mind. Uh, I know I've I've made several attempts and haven't made it. Uh, and you know, part of it is not really being experienced enough as a mountain flying pilot, and uh, and part of it is I got off too early, <laughs> like Clemens talked about. Um, and uh, but you know it. It can be a tense ride, and on the way back, if you don't if you don't uh, connect, and uh, sometimes you have to. Well, I haven't had to do it yet, but I mean, it's possible that you'd have to fly out through the canyons, which would be a pretty high. Not, not good. Not, yeah. not good. And I, I would stop yeah. doing this if then it would have definitely been way too low if I had ever to fly out of a canyon. So never got is, even close. And it is intimidating as you go out there because the ground is rising. And even though you're plenty high to make it back to the airport, when you look down at the ground, it's like, oh, I'm not oh, it's really- right there. It's right there, yeah. Well, yeah. you want to be high, you also want to be high enough from a spin perspective, right? So don't be so close to the grounds that if you, if you, if you spin in, you need to be able to have enough altitude to be able to recover. Yep, yep, but- uh, at any rate, uh, Clemens, this was terrific. How you did the graphics showing how the convergence works, because that that's I've always kind of been a little bit bamboozled by why the heck do we have a convergence there? And and uh, this was great to to show that. Uh, do we have any weather expert? Uh, Bob Ferris is here. He really knows weather well. Bob, do you have anything to say about convergence? Are you uh, still with us? Yeah, I'm still there. Uh, I thought that was an outstanding presentation and covered everything very, very well. Um, I even learned some stuff from it that it, I've been flying it for years. So Clemens did a great job and I think he covered all the bases very well. So nothing to add really. Nothing to add, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure that there really is much we can add there. Um, okay, well, um, Great, uh, and uh, you know, uh, this, I, I guess we'll just conclude it here, and uh, we'll see you all next week, uh, same place, uh, same Zoom link, uh, same time, same channel, so to speak. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm at a loss here. All of a sudden, I'm trying to remember what we have next week. Um, let me see here if I can find it. Um, does anybody know what? What, uh, who's on the schedule for next week? I, I think it's Florm and ADSB, Armin. Oh, yes. That's a good answer for the quiz. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> we're going to hear from Bill Kaywart, uh on Florm and ADSB. And, um, and I think also uh, 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 um, Alster is going to join you uh, to talk a little bit about um, connect, uh, what's he going to talk about, connections or. Um, uh, GPS antennas, which uh, he's going to talk about the GPS and the farm antennas and gliders, which, uh, you know, we can, the antenna thing is, is uh, always a challenge for us uh, uh, glider pilots. So, um, Bill, we look forward to seeing you uh, next week and, and hearing what you've come up with on farm ADSB collision avoidance. And uh, so we'll, We'll, I guess we'll leave it at that and uh, we'll see Bill next week. So uh, thanks everybody and uh, have a good week and let's hope we get some good weather and get some good flights in. Great job. Good night. Well, thanks, thanks, thanks for everybody. the presentation. Yeah, outstanding, thanks. Thank you guys. Thanks for sticking with me until the end. Appreciate it. Thank you. See you out there.